This remote, rocky corner of the Aegean Sea is largely forgotten by history. Except for one thing, the poet who gave birth to the Western Romantic tradition. But she and this island are remembered now mainly as a cultural curiosity. Today, Sappho exists only on the fringe of our consciousness. It's down to her that this island, Lesbos, has given its name to a whole aspect of human sexuality. But in the past, she was remembered not as a gay icon, but as a prostitute, a priestess, a schoolmistress, even as a tragic heroine who hurled herself off a cliff for love of a man. And all this rests on just a few fragile fragments of verse rescued from the desert. After thousands of years of slanders and obscurity, the real Sappho may be about to re-emerge thanks to 21st century science and dramatic archaeological discoveries. We're reading lines that haven't been read for thousands of years. To reignite centuries of smouldering controversy. She had her opinion and she wanted to say it. A heady cocktail of music, sex and religion. This sometimes turns same-sex couples into the ancient equivalent of suicide bombers. But at its heart, a real woman and her family in a time of personal and political turmoil. I want to piece together the jigsaw to get a picture of what Sappho was like. A real woman who still speaks to us from 600 years before Christ. Why have her name and her words resonated through the ages? What was so special about Sappho? In February 2014, a Greek text written in Roman Egypt briefly made headlines around the world. No one apart from a small group of scholars has seen it since the third century AD. So this is it. It's in Greek, but it comes from Egypt. It is, probably would have been taken there. Uh, from Alexandria by someone who retired or bought property and settled in the Fayum, and then eventually it, it wore out, and it was reused to make a kind of cardboard out of the pieces of it. This manuscript dates back to around 200 AD. An anonymous collector landed it on the desk of papyrologist Dirk Obink in 2012, unaware of what it contained. When the small pieces were humidified, they immediately started to peel off. And the first thing that you could see underneath were the ends of the first three lines. The letters that my eye first focused on were the second to the last word of the first line, charaxon, uh, that's a, a man's name, followed by the verb elthane in the spelling of the dialect of the island of Lesbos of the late 7th century. The only person we know in Greek antiquity who had the name Charaxos was the brother of the poetess Sappho from the island of Lesbos. And she was famous in antiquity, much loved and widely read and imitated and slandered. Um, uh, uh, but her poetry didn't survive. What did you feel like when you first realized what this was? Well, it knocked my socks off. But you always chatter on about Caraxus coming home with his ship full. Well, that's for what Dirk has discovered is the most complete poem to emerge in centuries by the first female writer in Western history, Sappho. That Caraxus bring his ship back home safely to port and find us. Written about 600 BC. In it, Sappho talks to someone close to her, a sister maybe, or her mother, about the fate of her two brothers. Simply leave it to the gods. First, there's Caraxos, away at sea. If that's the way Zeus wills. And then there's a younger one, Laricus, still struggling to grow up. And us, if Laricus would raise his head, if only he might one day be a man, 
the deep and dreary dragons of our This is not just a long lost work of ancient literature, but a window into the life of one of its most enigmatic personalities. By any standards, an extraordinary find. It's already started to send shockwaves way beyond the dreaming spires of academia. For a papyrologist, making this discovery is a bit like finding the Holy Grail. But actually, it's much more than that, because the question it promises to help solve, who was Sappho, has been at the heart of a vexed debate for centuries. The works of the Greeks have shaped the way we think today. So Sappho, antiquity's foremost female poet, has been critical in forming our perception of women. Ever since her work was first read, this question, what was a woman doing writing powerful personal poetry in a man's world, has always been about more than just Sappho. For centuries, what you have to say about Sappho has been code for what you have to say about women in general, and particularly about women who aren't afraid to speak their mind. So how did such a distant, unknown figure have such an impact on the world we live in today? Her voice seems to be personal, and that draws people in, makes them feel as though this, she's speaking directly to them. She sets up certain kinds of imagery, uh, which has come down to us through the centuries, and which has become hugely important in all kinds of popular culture and in any number of pop songs you care to mention. The silver moon, blonde hair, but above all, the symptoms of desire. The stuttering in the throat, the going hot and cold all over, um, in the presence of the beloved. She didn't really look like this, did she? <laughs> um, I don't think so. No, this is a, a, a 19th century idea of Sappho. Um, she's, here she is, she's exotic, she's erotic. Uh, she's wearing these thin, gauzy draperies that leave nothing to the imagination. Her breasts are exposed and she's sullen and brooding, this gaze looking down throughout. But what's interesting about this picture is that it offers us the key attributes of who Sappho is. So she's definitely a woman. She's got her lyre, uh, which very often appears in images of Sappho. She's by the sea, she's alone. And by the time we get to that period of history, um, Sappho has become a bit of a vamp. Over centuries of gender wars, Sappho has been endlessly recast. Dangerous emancipated woman, a high-class whore, an uptight schoolmistress, and a feminist icon. On the one hand, women consistently claim her as a model, as an intellectual woman. Um, but on the other hand, those who want to cut women in general down to size uh, point to her mm, unfortunate sexual practices. Mm. The point about Sappho is that because we have so little of her work, because we know so little of her life, she simply becomes this kind of empty space where you can paint in whatever it is that you want from your political, cultural um, or social needs. And she fills up those imperatives when actually there's only you and there's no Sappho there at all. Or so one might think. But with the recent revelations, there's more truth there than it appears. To start to find her, we need to strip away those years of mythology which have built up around her. That process started much closer to Sappho's time than ours, in ancient Greece itself. Athens is today the capital of Greece, but 25 centuries ago, it was the foremost of hundreds of independent city-states, going through an unparalleled cultural revolution. In the museum there, evidence still survives as to the esteem in which classical Greeks held the poet Sappho. Yes, you can see it here. There's S, A, P, P, and then there's another letter there. It has to be Sappho, and she's accompanied by several other ladies. There's one here who's actually bestowing a crown 
on her head. So, so as if she's won, won a competition? Or? Yes! The city is bestowing the crown for being the best poet or the best poetess on the figure of Sappho. Most of this kind of pot made in Athens with the red figures on the black slip have goddesses on, like Aphrodite or Athena, or they have nymphs or muses, but supernatural religious creatures. Here we have an actual historical person with a name, and this is really path-breaking and is really testimony to just how important she was in the Athenian imagination and the Athenian cultural sphere. Sappho is the only historical woman ever to have been depicted on an ancient Greek vase. And that's all the more extraordinary, given that when this was painted, Sappho was long dead from an island far away. This vase is 440 BC. This is an Athenian vase from the great democratic classical period of Athens, the famous period of, of philosophers and playwrights. But she's actually living and working around 600 BC. So this is more than a century and a half since Sappho herself was working. This vase is uh, showing us that a poet who's from Lesbos, which is an island way over the other side of the Aegean Sea, in fact, it's just a few miles off the Turkish coast, has got a reputation far away, a long sailing ship ride in, in the ancient world from the great city of Athens in the fifth century. So her reputation had spread. Do you think they'd have thought Sappho was exotic coming from this eastern island? Oh, definitely. Lesbos had a, had a very um, particular reputation. Firstly, for producing very beautiful women. They also had a very interesting accent, which would have sounded almost oriental to the Athenians. But the most interesting thing is that they really were um, supposed to be the sexiest uh, people in the entire Greek world. In fact, the word to do a lesbian is actually the ancient Greek for giving someone a blowjob. That's not quite what we associate Sappho with now, is it? It really isn't, but that's what the ancient Greeks did, and very definitely they associated it with a woman doing a blowjob on a man. So sex tourism capital of the Aegean. Absolutely. As far back as 450 BC, Sappho had a reputation for strange sexuality that was bound up with that of her exotic eastern island. A lesbian is, in fact, an inhabitant of Lesbos, the third largest island in the Greek archipelago, and one of the richest islands of the ancient Aegean. The reason for the other modern meaning of lesbian is the fact that this was the birthplace of the poet Sappho. Ancient authors wrote biographies of Sappho. They agree she came from this island, but they don't agree on much else. Her father was called Simon, or Eumenus, or Erigius, or Ecritus, or Semos, or Camon, or Etarchus, or Scamandronimus. They also tell us she was married to a very wealthy man called Circulus, who traded from Andros, which seems helpful until you realise that the comic poets invented this, and it means prick from Man Island. In Sappho's poems, she seems to refer to a daughter, Clais. So she may have been a wife and mother. But what has excited and amazed generations of readers is what she has to say about the other women around her. And on soft beds, delicate, you quenched your desire. Pacing far away, her gentle heart devoured by powerful desire, she remembers slender Athis. Weeping, she left me. For most historical figures, we're used to knowing facts. For Sappho, we know very little about how she lived, who she was, what she did. But what we do know about are her feelings, what she was passionate about, the women she loved, Athis, Megara, Telesippa, Mika. He seems to me an equal of the gods. Whoever gets to sit across from you and listen to the sound of your sweet speech, so close to him. In this poem, you think she's in love with a man, but it turns out she's in love with the girl he's sitting next to. Oh, it makes my panicked heart go fluttering in my chest. For the moment I catch sight of you, there's no speech left in me, but tongue gags. 
all at once. It's because of poetry like this that we now think of Sappho as homosexual. Eyes no longer capable of sight. And Lesbos has become a global byword for gayness in women, with Sappho, the iconic first lesbian. The place of Sappho's birth was Erosos in the far west. It's one of the most beautiful spots on the whole island. In the summer, it thrives on a tourist industry built around Sappho. And every year, women flock from Europe and America to enjoy the women-only nudist beaches, the pick-up opportunities, and the free bohemian atmosphere. When I arrived, it was the off-season, but the most dedicated expats and local converts agreed to meet me for a drink and a chat in the famous 10th Muse bar. <laughs> but she's got a fan club here, has she? The lesbians probably think about her as their, uh, you know, their guru, let's say, yeah. The starter of the movement, I'm saying, generally speaking. But uh, somebody else can approach her because of the fact that she was a great poetess, you know, because of her talent and her contribution and everything. So everybody depends what they want to have. You know, here there's a lot of artistic people drawn yeah. into here. Maybe that's the spirit of Sappho what keeps them here, you know? Maybe she says, like, stay here, yeah. stay here. The Sappho, in effect, started it, was the, was the catalyst. She was the first woman ever that she had the courage to stand up and say, listen, I'm feeling this, I don't give a damn about what you are saying, I feel this, and I'm going to say it. And she said it in the most beautiful way. And after I, I, I read Sappho, uh, I felt that there was somebody behind me. She was my great, great, great grandmother. And she was feeling the same things with me, and that was uh, an amazing thing, <laughs> in a way. Great, 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 great. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can say that, but, you know, she was, she was feeling the same things. This is the most recent vision of Sappho, the lesbian icon. But is this modern idea of her just as much an anachronism as the 19th century vamp? or the Edwardian schoolmistress. James Davidson has literally written the book on Greek love, and it's a culture that defies our categories of lesbian, gay and straight. Here we have frottage between the thighs, surrounded by people in the gymnasium. You see, two of them. Yes. In public. People with wreaths, um, a kind of dancer even. Um, is this a reflection of reality, or is this just a...? Just some artist putting a whole lot of things together to make a pretty pod. Societies are strange, you know, societies do strange things, and this is a really peculiar cultural phenomenon. Instead of uh, Greek homosexuality, I sometimes think it should be called Greek homo-besottedness, because it's always so over the top, it's always so extreme. And that seems to be almost a unique phenomenon. In Thebes, an army unit was created entirely of lovers. In Athens, love affairs could become political alliances. For men, gay love wasn't just personal preference. It was often the glue which held society together. So do you think she was following the male practice in writing poetry like that, or do you think she was um, a groundbreaker? The female version is much more difficult to, to discover. Sappho is, you know, as the ancient critics say, she is a thaumaston crema. She's an, a wonderful, amazing thing. She's a phenomenon. So there's no question about that. But it, any kind of genius still follows on the culture of their time. What we are told is that in Sparta, the women had relationships just like the men because we've even got a poem which is a maiden chorus in which the girls are flirting with each other while they're performing a ritual. But I think what's interesting about this whole phenomenon of Greek love, Greek homosexuality for men and women, is that it seems to be um, a kind of cultural and social institution. They're using it as a, a way of social cohesion to break out of family groups, to establish, if you like, to establish a community so that an army of lovers is also is an army which breaks out of clan groupings and tribal groupings and unites the whole polis. 
There's no doubt that Sappho was in love with women, but she wasn't a lesbian in our terms. In her culture, homosexual feelings and practices were an important part of life in mainstream heterosexual society. And she is our best evidence that this was also true of women. So it seems to understand Sappho, we need to abandon our own preconceptions and build up a picture from the evidence alone. The problem is that for a long time, there hasn't been very much evidence to go on. For centuries, we had no such thing as a text of Sappho because none had been handed down to us from the ancient world. Maybe all those monks and Islamic scholars who copied out the works of antiquity didn't want to spend months of their time, not to mention expensive ink and vellum, reproducing love poetry written by a possible degenerate in a strange Eastern Greek dialect. So how did we know anything of her work, you may ask? Well, we found bits of it quoted by ancient authors, but not in anthologies of ancient poetry. In grammar books, analysing the dialect and the verse metre on Lesbos. The aeolic dactylic tetrameter acatalectic is as follows. Sappho has composed a line which includes two ithyphallics. And speak Come again, to them is used in aeolic. Once again, love, alpha. that loosener of limbs, Compare, bittersweet and inescapable. It's like finding a gold necklace in a heap of rubbish. This is the first time in Western literature that anyone has defined love as limb loosening, bittersweet, irresistible. This is the birth of our Western tradition of love poetry. And we find it in a handbook on the aeolic dactylic tetrameter acatalectic. These short quotations by other authors were all anyone knew of Sappho until the 19th century, when everything started to change. In 1896, two British archaeologists, Bernard Grenfell and Arthur Hunt, were excavating what looked like unpromising rubbish mounds in the small ancient town of Oxyrhynchus in Egypt. They soon realised that what they were finding beneath their feet were piles and piles of papyrus, thrown away by the Greeks who lived there. When these were shipped back to Oxford, they revealed shopping lists, accounts, personal letters, and most excitingly, lost works of Greek literature, including fragments of unknown poems by Sappho. All humankind in beauty, Sing of the bride with shapely feet she could not remember. Some say foot soldiers, others call the fleet, but I say it's whatever you love. Since 1896, scholars have gone through a hundred of the boxes that came back from Oxyrhynchus. There are still 700 left to decipher. So at this rate, we'll be finished in seven centuries' time. Today, though, we at least have technology to help with the task. Where we're at with data visualization, with just you know very simple tools that allow us to see fragments like this, but not in a static way. We can actually manipulate them, move them around, and it actually allows for great freedom. So with delicate pieces of papyrus like this, we don't actually have to physically uh, touch them and you know beat them up. We can just do this visually, and it helps preserve the fragments. You can do that even if you haven't got all the pieces of papyrus where you are, can't you? Yes, yes, that's even better. So you could be sitting anywhere around the world uh, and still, you know, working on your reconstruction of Sappho. It's an almost impossible jigsaw, not least because we only have a fraction of the pieces. So a big part of the job is guessing what might have been in the gaps. But every now and then, new archaeological discoveries emerge which replace our guesswork with the real thing. In the early 2000s, there was a new discovery from Cologne. This is what with the so-called Cologne Sappho papyrus. What's specific about this fragment is that where the fragment from Oxyrhynchus breaks off on all these lines, the Cologne fragment fills them out for us. You can see the pairing of the same exact lines here. 
For the longest time, we just had this word for, for fawns, nebroisin, and originally it was more thinking that the girl was dancing around like a fawn, but what the Cologne papyrus showed us is that it was actually quite, quite different. It was about Sappho, you know, her knees are old, and so they don't, don't carry her quite the same way, whereas once before, she, they were very nimble and she danced like a, like a fawn. So we now know she's talking about old age, really, and not being able to yes. dance around like fawns, like, like young deer, yes. anymore. I oh, have some sympathy with, with that. We're reading lines that haven't been read for thousands of years. And in this case, you know, it's not just any poet, it's, it's, a, it's a female poet, it's a woman's voice. And, you know, her voice has been emanating very silently and quietly for, for decades, centuries. And the more fragments we find, the louder her voice becomes. Piece by piece, fragment by fragment, we are building up a picture of the real Sappho. Not young and sexy here, but aging with bad knees. And there's another blow to our image of Sappho, the confessional lesbian writer. These written documents all date to centuries after her death. In Sappho's day, writing was newfangled technology. Poetry was something to be learned by heart and sung out loud. Everybody forgets that ancient Greek poetry was actually sung music. Armand Dungur has used ancient evidence to reconstruct what the New Brothers poem might originally have sounded like. The first line where it says, Al ai trilesta carax on elten, you hear my voice going up and down. Um, and if we then apply them to this scale system, the Mixolydian scale, um, so you could say go something like This otherworldly music was to Greeks the chief appeal of Sappho. Both these words and this tune would have spread through the Greek world orally long before they were written down. People are much more likely to remember a song than a poem, aren't they? The muses, who were the goddesses of poetry and song and dance, were, in myth, uh, the nine muses, were the daughters of Mnemosyne, which means memory. This, this must have been the most marvellous music as well as poetry. I mean, I think there's every reason to think that she was one of the great poets of the ancient world and must have been a wonderful musician. Sappho wasn't a writer, she was a singer, songwriter. It's a revelation that shifts your perspective completely. It sets our quest off in a new direction. What kind of woman could be a singer in ancient Lesbos? In the ancient Greek societies we know anything about, it was quite something for a woman to perform music in public. Sappho isn't just the earliest Greek female poet we know of, she's practically the only one. And in historical times, respectable Greek women were supposed to stay at home. We even know that in Crete, if a man raped a woman in her own home, he was fined a thousand staters. If he raped her in the street, the fine was reduced by 50%. By being out, effectively, she was asking for it. The only women men would have seen singing and dancing would have been like this woman here, playing the flute, wearing sexy see-through garments at an all-male drinking party. A prostitute, basically. Sappho might not have been a lesbian, but she might have been some kind of geisha or courtesan. In Germany, one expert went through her work piece by piece to pick out the names of girls Sappho loved and others she hated, with surprising results. Apparently, there are four kinds of names. Some are ethnic names, like Athis, which means she comes from Athens, or they're abstract nouns, like peace or justice, or nicknames, 
like Girino, which means tadpole, and Dorica, gift lover. And there are names from mythology, like Andromeda and Gorgo. The theory is that those names are not far from modern porn star names, like Houston or Fantasy. And even the name Sappho, or should I say, Sappho, is a strange word. It's not Greek at all. So what's going on here? The term Sappho uses for her friends, hetairai, companions, is the one later Greeks used for courtesans, or high-class prostitutes. So is this what we're missing? Was Sappho leading a band of go-go dancers who offered a little more than just titillating songs? Or are we yet again being misled by other people's prejudice? We have to remember that Sappho lived at a specific time and place with its own distinctive culture. And there, it seems, there were other venues for a performer than an all-male drinking party. Lesbos, way back in 600 BC, was a different place from the classical world of later centuries. The island still glimmers with haunting natural beauty. And to an ancient poet, that was evidence for the presence of the divine. Sappho is full of images of the natural world that surrounded her. Roses, honey clover, chervil, and moonlight over the briny sea. We can still see all of that today. But for her, that whole natural world was populated by gods. Gods were everywhere. And gods are everywhere in her poetry. For a go-go girl, Sappho seems surprisingly obsessed with religion. The heart of her sacred landscape was known literally as the middle, Mesa, an idyllic spot in the heart of the countryside where worshippers would come together from all four corners of Lesbos. I went there with Cathy Morgan, director of the British School at Athens. <laughs> It creates the impression of having two colonnades around. Local archaeologist Yanis Kurtzelis showed us what remains of the ancient temple to three of the great Olympian gods. The sanctuary was a temenos for the immortals, blessed gods Zeus, Hera and Dionysus. And it's good he did because you need to look carefully to see the remains of the building that Sappho might have known. We, we can imagine uh, from the remains an oblong building with uh, small dimensions. Quite narrow as well. Yes, yes. Because maybe it was not for the citizens, just for the god. So these columns that we can see now were, were later. They weren't here in archaic times. They're the, the classical one about yes. 300 years after Sappho. Yes, definitely. We have to, to imagine a wooden colonnade on the three on the on the sides of the temple, and then then a stone wall inside that. Definitely, yes. And then yes. behind it is the the later the later building, classical, which building. is much much bigger. Yeah. When Sappho was alive, all that was here was a tiny chapel-sized building, now dwarfed by the monumental temple built later. In her time, the building itself was an afterthought. What mattered? was this holy piece of land set aside for the gods and the island-wide festivals that regularly took place here. I imagine a Greek festival with all this colour and blood and wealth being sacrificed and social business going on as being a kind of contra uh, mixture of state funeral, Woodstock, uh, <laughs> whichever you like to call it. The sort of nice bleached view of a Greek sanctuary that sometimes we have is completely alien. Yes, we think of people wafting around in spotless white garments in white marble buildings, don't we? Neatly blood stage, yes, that's yes. right. Yes. <laughs> and you mentioned song and, and performance. Is it possible that, that Sappho, 
that a woman like Sappho might have had a role performing at a ceremony here. Very likely, actually. Well, we do have visual evidence of lines of women dancing and performing. So dance, presumably song and music attached to it. And her songs might have been sung by her leading, leading a chorus. Is that possible? Perfectly possible. Yes. Far from the seedy drinking parties of Athens, it may be at these raucous countryside festivals where we should imagine Sappho performing, possibly with other girls from the community. Which isn't quite our idea of a sort of paid singer, and maybe paid is the wrong term as well. Mm. These rituals are a reminder about what society is, what it feels like. So paying someone else to come in and perform, uh, perhaps, but it's a little bit different from the, the occasion in the festival where the women of the community come and sing their song. It's almost like dances in Greek villages nowadays. In the new poem, Sappho entrusts the fate of her brother to the king of the gods, Zeus. She asks to be sent to pray to his queen, the goddess Hera, and hopes for another god, or daimon, to give them relief from their troubles, most probably Dionysus, the god of wine. Wouldn't it have gone down better if she was singing these words here at the sanctuary to those three gods, rather than just at some late-night men's drinking party? This all starts to make sense. Sappho may have performed her songs here in front of people from all over the island of Lesbos. Maybe she even made her name here. Far from a showgirl, Sappho may have been renowned for performing at religious events. For some people, this has been a chance to pigeonhole her once more. A priestess, possibly of the goddess of love, Aphrodite. But do you have to be a priestess to sing religious songs? When I was in Eresus, I was lucky enough to be invited to a real big, fat Greek wedding. And this is one kind of religious occasion where we can be pretty sure Sappho performed. A whole book of the complete works of Sappho is devoted to wedding songs. There's the ones for the hen night. Virgins, celebrate all night. Let's get all the unmarried men your age so we'll get less sleep than the nightingale. And then there's the ones when the groom is coming. Hymenaeus, Hymenaeus, here comes the groom like Ares. That's the god of war, and he's larger than even a big man. And then, perhaps sadly, the wedding night itself. Remember, the bride might only be 12 years old and getting married to someone more than twice her age. Virginity, virginity, where have you gone? And the chorus singing, we've gone, never to return. To change? Yeah. That's too beautiful not to wear. But too big, I can't too dance. Big, yes. <laughs> Religious celebrations the world over are also an excuse for a knees up. I can picture Sappho at an evening like this. The best singer-songwriter anyone knew. She could muster a hymn to the gods in the day and a party tune for the celebrations as the night drew on. I don't think we need to pigeonhole Sappho as a priestess any more than a prostitute. Singing about love, and singing to the gods were just natural things for a poet to do. And now, the discovery of a new poem is opening up another side to her life, her family. But you always chatter on about Caraxus coming home with his ship full. Well, that's for Zeus. And for What's the real story behind this poem? Someone's nagging Sappho about the need for her brother to come back with a full ship. Our best guess is that's her mother. There's no mention of a father anywhere. Her other brother is little more than a child. He's serving wine to the grown-ups in the town hall. 
And if Caraxes blows it all on fast women in Egypt, the family fortunes may well depend on Sappho. The family were most likely landowners in the small town of Eresus, but at some point Sappho moved east to the island's largest city, Mytilene. Today, a huge fortress occupies the site of Sappho's city. And on the horizon is a reminder why. The coast of Asia, only six miles away. In recent centuries, political tensions with Turkey have turned this narrow strait into a tensely watched frontier. But in Sappho's time, the people across the water were trading partners, not enemies. Although sailing the Aegean did have its dangers. You keep chattering that Caraxus must come with his ship full. And I wonder how many women from Mytilene stood somewhere like this, gazing out to sea, looking for a son or a brother or a husband. And some of them may have prayed too, although probably not all to Queen Hera. But think how much greater the anxiety must have been in 600 BC, with no proper maps, no letters home. And people like Caraxus were sailing right to the edge of the then known world. And many of them didn't return. But the ones that did come back transformed the society and the culture here on Lesbos. Headscarves, fragrant purple. Manassas sent you from Fakaya. Valuable gifts. Sappho's poems tell of a world in which sailors were coming back to Lesbos with tantalising, exotic goods. A decorated slipper, a lovely piece of Lydian work, robe, saffron, Phrygian, purple, broidered headbands from Sardis. pieces are fantastic, they're really beautiful. I mean, look at how fine those designs are. These treasures of the British Museum give us a sense of the Eastern luxury Sappho might have known. Yeah, this beautiful jewellery comes from a number of different graves from the end of the 7th century BC in Camerus Rhodes. So not far from Lesbos, and about the time Sappho was alive. Yes. So when Sappho writes about a, a headband for her daughter, she might have been thinking about something like this piece here. That's right. If she was uh, extremely wealthy, it might have been a gold piece like this. Um, alternatively, she might have had something from textile. Could they have been made in Greece or imported? These were probably made locally, but the representation of this winged goddess with the... Uh, beautiful little uh, uh, lions either side, is a motif that you get from the Near East. Because what's this little figure here? It is an Egyptian uh, faience bottle for perfumes. So it's not too far-fetched to think of Sappho uh, sitting, uh, putting on perfume from something like that and maybe fastening her cloak or her dress with something like that. Of course. This finery all comes from a time when Greeks were reaching across the Mediterranean as traders and colonists. And Caraxus, it seems, may have been headed for Egypt. We understand from uh, a number of different sources that he was trading wine with Egypt. And the major trading port of Egypt at this time was Naucratis. And this was the port where all traders, including our friends from uh, Lesbos, would have come. Now, this settlement was settled around the time of Sappho's birth. And we find a lot of Greek objects, including those that the Greek traders dedicated to their deities. And these two here came from Lesbos. And this one here mentions a dedication by someone from Mytilene. Right, so that might have been Caraxus. Well, who knows? Potentially. Caraxus was one of thousands of young men across Greece, setting out with the produce of their family farm, gambling on making a profit in places like Naucratis the ancient equivalents of Hong Kong or Dubai. Sappho would have had no way of knowing what had become of her brother 
and the family's precious cargo. But incredibly, we do. By an extraordinary coincidence, the historian Herodotus mentions him in a passage about a high-class courtesan called Rhodopis, Rosy Face. Well, what he actually says is, Rhodopis, our heroine for the moment, came to Egypt, she arrived and she worked there as a prostitute, and then she was freed for a great sum of money by a man from Mytilene called Caraxos, son of Scamandronimos, who was the brother of Sappho, the poetess. But he was a bit of a bad boy. I think probably he spent pretty much all his liquid cash on uh, freeing her. And do we know what Sappho thought of that? Herodotus says in a poem, <laughs> Sappho abused her brother uh, immensely. And I think Sappho was not happy with the way her brother was both spending his money, which was in a way her money, on freeing what probably she would have called a tart. So, she wasn't thinking... so instead of returning to Mytilene with a profit for the family, Caraxus blew everything on this romance with Rosy Face. And when he got back, Sappho angrily confronted him in a song which hasn't survived. So she wasn't taking the moral high ground, probably. It was a business I issue. I wonder, it could have been both. Was she a respectably married woman with a child and therefore was um, ripping up, you know, really ripping into uh, a feckless brother who should have settled down and got married to a nice Mytilinean girl? You know, one doesn't know about that. This finally makes sense of the new poem we've discovered. Sappho must have sung a series of songs about her brother. The one we have found is set early on in the story. She's telling her mother not to get her hopes up about Caraxus. Then later, she sang one to Caraxus himself, berating him for leaving the family without a penny. It's a tragic domestic soap opera, far removed from the lesbian romances we've come to expect from Sappho. And it shows us the real problems a woman faced in 600 BC. And in Oxford, there's intriguing evidence that the problems she faced weren't just financial, but political. This stone was purchased in 1627 by Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel, who was a prominent courtier of Charles I, but also a prominent grand tourist and art collector. And this is actually the oldest historical record that we have from ancient Greece. It's a crude list of dates, originally set up on the island of Paros, and telling the key events of Greek history from 1580 to 263 BC. It's very difficult to read now because the letters have got so worn over time. But what this bit actually says is Afhu Sappho ek Mytilenis e Sicilian e Plusa Fugusa. Excuse my awful accent. But what that means is that a certain period of time had elapsed since Sappho sailed from Mytilene to Sicily, fleeing. The rest of the section gives us more information so that we can date it. But what's interesting is that word fugusa, which I've translated as fleeing, but which really suggests that she was sent into exile. The discovery of this stone was like a bolt from the blue. From it, we learn in a few faint carvings that Sappho was exiled from her home city to the island of Sicily, about a week's sail away. Then, all is silence. So not only was Sappho bankrupted by her brother, she fell foul of the authorities enough to be sentenced to exile. To find out why, we need to go back to the turbulent world of Sappho's Mytilene. So, James, what was Mytilene like when Sappho was alive? What was going on here? Well, amazingly, we actually have evidence from one of her contemporaries, 
someone called Alcaeus, who was writing maybe 10 or 20 years before Sappho's time. And he describes a world which was um, actually very politically disturbed. There was lots of faction fighting, endless coups and counter coups, and um, people trying to establish tyrannies. Alcaeus, like Sappho, wrote about passionate homosexual love affairs. But for him, that was partly about bonding with his fellow conspirators. Quite a party, really. Would Sappho have been part of that scene at all? So one thing, some of the papyri are revealing more and more about the, the way that maybe Sappho and her friends could be involved also in these family politics, because some of the names that we hear in Alcaeus and the faction of Alcaeus and his brothers also crop up in some of the papyri of Sappho. I've got one here. It concerns someone called Mika. But I shall not allow you. You chose the friendship of ladies of the house of Penthilus. And that house of Penthilus seems to be one of the original, um, very old aristocratic families that um, starts all the faction fighting. So that's a tiny clue to indicate that the, uh, the women and Sappho's ladies are uh, also involved with the faction fighting. So when she's complaining that Mika's left her, it isn't just that she's left her for another woman or another man, she's crossed over to the enemy, she's gone to the other side. That seems to be the case, yes. So just as with Alcaeus, that underneath the romantic and the loving, hot, erotic poetry, there seems to be some kind of politics of alliance going on. Whose side are you on? You used to be my lover, used to love me, and now you've gone over to the other side. Well, women are, of course, more subtle than men, we know that, don't we? <laughs> Some women are more subtle. This is a completely new perspective on the love affairs of Sappho. But behind all that talk of love was political alliance making. And Sappho must have allied with the wrong side to end up in exile. Bankrupted, exiled, each step in this tale takes us further from the otherworldly Sappho of romantic cliché. We're uncovering, I feel, not a dreamer, but a prominent figure on the island of Lesbos. A celebrated performer at its great festivals and gatherings. A woman heading up one of its great families in the absence of her brothers a player in the island's cutthroat political struggles. But this truth about her was slowly clouded by the mists of time, and we've replaced it with the image of a poetess we wanted to see. And nowhere is this truer than with the story of Sappho's death. Of course, a passionate, tragic poet had to come to a passionate, tragic end. And the legend is that Sappho killed herself by leaping from the cliff of Lefkas. At some point in history, a tragic love story grew up about Sappho and a man called Faun that ended with her suicide on the white cliff of Lefkas, far off in Western Greece. It's ironic, isn't it? that a woman whose poetry was so full of love for other women goes down in history as having leapt to her death for love of a man. Well, it's rubbish, of course. The story is that she worked among her girls and then she fell in love with this handsome young man called Phaon, who in fact had been an old ferryman but was translated and made youthful by Aphrodite. And Sappho falls in love with him, deserts all her girls and runs after him. And he's not interested, so she throws herself off the cliff of Leucadia, you know, as you do. For centuries, Sappho's leap has been the most common image associated with her. But this melodramatic suicide story is a fiction, shaped in large part by the antipathy of male elites towards powerful women. So she's overreached herself in a number of ways then? Absolutely. She's writing poetry. She's claiming a public role. She's speaking about women. 
And all of this is, is out there and it has a political content as far as uh, other viewers are concerned. So this is why that has to be taken back and she has to be consumed with feeling. She has to be put back into a classic feminine role which is sexualized and then she has to die. That's the end. <laughs> yeah, the end. So she throws herself off the cliff. And this picture of Sappho killing herself becomes hugely prevalent just at this moment when women are beginning to claim rights to education, to employment, to the custody of their children. And it's so a, this is what happens to you. Yes. If you go down that route, this is what will happen. This reshaping of Sappho's story by male artists began in ancient Greece itself. But at some time, Sappho actually became a figure of fun, didn't she? Yes, absolutely. It's really strange that this poetess becomes a sort of grotesque comic role. In fact, several playwrights wrote comedies about her. If there was any one place that reshaped Sappho's reputation, it was here, the theatre of Dionysus in Athens, where a century after Sappho, the world's first plays were performed. Ancient Greek comedy is actually all played by male actors in front of male audiences, but they liked to see men in transvestite roles. And it seems as though Sappho was played very, very ugly, very, very small, and, and the ancient Greeks didn't like short women, very dark, dark-skinned, and she did all sorts of strange things. She seems to have fancied men often younger than her, and she's very randy and rather desperate. And I think it's a response in the 5th century in Athens, which was the kind of society where female sexuality wasn't something that was uh, uh, allowed to be talked about in, in public, and respectable women certainly it wasn't recognised that they had any kind of sex life or sexual experience. So it's in that context that an educated, in fact aristocratic woman with a public sex drive has to be made funny, burlesque, and comic. It's the only way that a patriarchal male society can cope with her. Because otherwise they'd feel threatened by her. I think they genuinely would feel threatened by her. And they don't want their women to have a role model like her. They certainly don't, so she's got to be small, dark, hideous, ugly and a figure of fun. As the mythologised Sappho grew in popularity, so the real Sappho's influence slowly waned. And by the 8th century AD, the last books of her works had been consigned to the dust heap. But now, 2,600 years after her death, she is finally re-emerging from obscurity. We know that the family fortune was blown by Caraxus on his rosy-faced courtesan, and maybe one day we will know if Laricus ever did grow up to become a man, and what became of Sappho's daughter. Clays, and we may never know what actually became of the poet herself. But Sappho knew that she would have the last word. She wasn't afraid to say about people that she didn't like. But when you die, you will lie there, and afterwards there will never be any recollection of you or any longing for you. Unseen in the house of Hades, you will go to and fro among the shadowy corpses. But of herself, she wrote, if you judge me by the divine muses, you will know that I escaped the gloom of Hades and that no day will ever dawn that does not speak the name of Sappho, the lyric poet. And so far, she's been right. Go online now for a Q&A with Margaret Mountford and more exclusive content from the programme at bbc.co.uk slash Sappho. Next year on BBC4, though, we get a time-watch guide to Cleopatra. Oh, no,